Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people recognize that, you know, I was a I was a 16 year old senior in high school. You know what I mean? Like I skipped a grade in elementary school. And so when I graduated um, and you got to remember, this is the early 90s. There's no Internet. There's no finding players oh, yeah. in Santa Cruz County. There's no you know, the only thing you're going to find in Santa Cruz County at that time was surfers and skaters. And although we had a pretty kind of under the radar, like some really good athletes in Santa Cruz County and Santa Cruz Island in particular. And so in between my freshman year of junior college at Cabrillo in Santa Cruz County and my senior year in high school, I made what I thought was a pretty level headed decision as a 17 year old to get a job at a retirement home. I worked in the kitchen as a bus boy and a waiter. And I got a gym membership at World Gym in downtown, kind of like midtown Santa Cruz. I would get up at six in the morning. I'd ride the bus to work. I'd work from um, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. I would get two meals there. I would walk or ride the bus to the gym, which was mm, a couple miles away. A good walk, but an easy bus ride. I'd lift for an hour, hour and a half every day. And I would repeat that, dude. And of course, there was some in-between fun. I had a girlfriend in high school at the time. She lived in the mountains of Santa Cruz. Like, there was definitely some breakups in there. But dude, as a 17-year-old, I had a full-time gig, and I was going to the gym. And my goal was to get to Cabrillo and be a beast when I got there. And I had no intention of playing football. None. I had a really kind of up-and-down experience. Quite good as a senior, but didn't think I was utilized right by my coaches in, in high school. Really, really, really loved baseball. My dream was to get a baseball scholarship to UC Santa Barbara. That's really what I wanted to do. So, you know, I think as a 17-year-old, as a I made a level-headed decision to get a job and get a gym membership. Like, I knew that I wanted to gain some weight. I knew that I was at a disadvantage. I'd been at, at a competitive disadvantage my whole life, but physically, I was, as, I was as, as good or better than most kids my age or even a little bit older. So I played above my age for sure. I definitely think I played above the talent level, but – probably not worthy of a division one scholarship as a 16 turning 17 year old senior in high school. So I made the choice that if my dream is to be a division one athlete, I wasn't even thinking about professional sports. My dream was college degree, division one athlete. How do I do it? Baseball, UC Santa Barbara. That's my goal. I was first team all County in Santa Cruz. I was a first team all league in Santa Cruz as an outfielder and a pitcher. I think I was third in the County and hitting in like, you know, like third in the county in pitching in regard to ERA. Our, my Santa Cruz High team went to the Central Coast section finals. We lost to a school called Carlmont. It's the furthest that Santa Cruz High had gone in baseball in years. So, you know, I was thinking all baseball. Although I love playing basketball, had a good year. You know, football had a good year. But as I said, my football coach in high school kind of left me a bit disillusioned. I, I really thought I should have been playing quarterback. You know, like I pitched in baseball. I played shortstop. I did. I played all these high pressure positions and in football he's like oh you're gonna play running back you're gonna play linebacker I was like oh all right I guess I guess you know better than me coach so you know I I took this this year off and got this job in this in, in this retirement home and as I said I rode the bus and went to the gym and I did this for a year by the time the school year came around for Cabrillo uh, junior college in Santa Cruz County um, I was so motivated dude I was so motivated I never loved school so much. I never appreciated the consistency and the predictability of the classroom. I was always a good student and it was time to kick ass and take names. And to be honest, I had no desire to play football at Cabrillo, but I, I, I met coach Cox, who was the head coach of football at Cabrillo at the time. And he said, look, I know you, I got a position for you. The kind of offense we run, you know, I, I grew up, uh, didn't grow up. He actually went to college which, with Bill Walsh. He knew Bill Walsh. And he knew the West Coast offense, and he ran that at Cabrillo. It was very tight end and running back centric. And he said that he, he had a role for me. I just had to prove to him that I could learn the playbook. Um, and my freshman year of football started a little wobbly, but by the, time, by the time we got to the third or fourth game, dude, they were playing me at tight end. They were playing me at running back. They were playing me at fullback. They were playing me in the slot. You know, at 6'2", probably about 220 my freshman year. Um, probably legit running a four, six, I could pretty much play anywhere in a JC level. They could put me a linebacker if they wanted to, but I wanted the ball in my hand. You know yeah. I mean? So, so I ended up by the end of the year, you know, I think I ended up being like just a Swiss army knife. You know, I think we had one game that really got me on the map against one of our rivals, Gavlin college. And I think I had like seven catches for 160 yards and like one or two touchdowns. And that's when I started getting recruited by Kansas and Louisville and, and San Diego State and University of New Mexico and 
it was a dream come true, dude. I remember like almost being brought to tears when I got my first letter, my first recruitment letters, all I ever wanted. The crazy thing was, it was in football. It wasn't even in baseball. Baseball season hadn't even started yet. You know what I mean? So I went on the baseball field, dude, and I smashed. I think I led the team in home runs. I hit around 370. So uh, ended up being first team all, ended up being, I don't think, I don't know if I was first team or second team in, in baseball my freshman year. Um, but I was all conference in baseball. And then my sophomore year of football came around and I was like a blue chip, all American tight end. You know, I was first team, all everything, you know, all state honorable mention. And that's when I accepted basically my football scholarship to San Diego state at somewhere along the way I transitioned from baseball, baseball, baseball to Marshall Falk, Aztecs, black and red, like to be in Aztec, to be in San Diego. It seems so big to me coming from Santa Cruz. I took two trips. I went to New Mexico. When I went to San Diego State, Coach Toner's like, look, dude, we want you. Coach Kraft wants you. If you leave here and don't commit, I can't guarantee you. You know, he put yeah. the pressure on me. I was like, oh, I'm coming. Like, don't worry. I'll, I'll be here in the spring because I was a qualifier. That's the thing that made me look kind of good for them was that I could come in the spring because I already had the grades. So it was awesome to transfer into San Diego State as a sophomore. I got to live in, in the VAs right there on campus. Mm -hmm. Like, to have that true big college experience, dude, I was so honored. I was so humbled. I was blown away by the atmosphere. San, San Diego was like a big ass Santa Cruz in a lot of ways. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, a lot of very similar. Totally. Yeah, you know, yeah. And just the beach and, you know, being able to be with like, you know, just real Division One athletes. I, I didn't know if I belonged there, but quickly, you know, you fake it till you make mm -hmm. it. I don't care if it's business or if it's athletics, dude. You, you, act, like you, you're, you act like you're supposed to be there. Right. And then eventually you figure the rest of it out, you know. So that's kind of what ended up happening with you know, my kind of like my high school, the JC to, to San Diego State journey. And I was a, a initially a journalism major at SDSU. That was an impacted program. And, you know, we were majoring in football, bro. Let's yeah. So I switched from journalism to psychology, which my dad had a PhD in psychology. And once again, at SDSU, I think I had a 3.2 GPA. I was never getting in trouble. I never, I never had bad grades. I had good grades. It was easy. And I loved it. I loved being on, in, on campus. I never missed class. Didn't always study, but didn't really need to. Had a pretty good memory, could just digest information. And I enjoyed the whole experience, dude, from being a student to going to the parties to making friends, you know, from, you know, think about this for a minute. Uh, I'm sure I, I'm sure you remember, like, you know, we were friends with the with the girls soccer team and we were friends right. with the girls softball team and, and the swim team and, you know, men's basketball. It's like we had such a great camaraderie at SDSU and, you know, that kind of phrase, you know, you know, Aztec for life. That's a real thing that we still say. And I, I so appreciate the guys that I met, uh, the teammates that I had, I keep in touch with a ton of them. I made San Diego my home for over 20 years. I moved my mom from San Diego, from Santa Cruz to San Diego. She lives in Encinitas now. I lived in Encinitas for a long time, had a brand new build, uh, um, a house there at one point that I built from the ground up. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of the the, the college story, brother. Yeah. I, I want to give you a little time because if you let me, dude, I'll just mow over <laughs> you with a long ass hour long story. No, I love it, man. I love it. Uh, and we were talking about it earlier, dude. You you showed up representing. You got the uh, the old school SDSU T-shirt on. I do. 1995, people. This is from 1995. Yeah. This is my my daughter calls this vintage. She steals it and goes, Dad, I want that vintage SDSU shirt you got. I'm like, hey, that's my shirt. I, I hear you, bro. Yeah, but the, the thing is, it is vintage. I mean, think about how old it is, man. And we were talking yeah, a long vintage, 20, 26 years ago or whatever that is. Yeah. Um, cool, man. Well, so where, 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 where are you living now, man? Where, where are you at? Yeah. Yeah. So so I'm, I'm living back in, in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. Um, you know, most people, you know, not most, but you know, I got, I got signed as a free agent by the Minnesota Vikings yeah. out of SDSU. I was actually playing baseball at SDSU because I was actually better at baseball than so football. You, know you played baseball, baseball at San Diego State. You, you were a two sport. I played baseball at San Diego State. Okay. Yeah, I, I basically um, I did. I, I waited for my senior year to end, but I had two years of baseball eligibility, mm -hmm. and I still had a redshirt year left. Mm -hmm. So I was going to redshirt and just play baseball and play two years of baseball, dude. I went out there and I I did well. You know, Billy Blanton was out there sure. too, our, our quarterback, but he ended up giving it up and he wanted to go play football in Canada. And you know, he had his own dreams and wishes, but I stuck with it for a bit and then. One day, Coach Tolner called me into his office. He's like, hey, um, there's a lot of NFL scouts that want to know who number nine is with the visor. I don't know if you remember, I wore a yeah. visor my senior year. They're like, they're asking, like, who you are and, like, what's the deal with you? Are you going to be at the pro day? And I'm telling them that you're playing baseball. Like, I know you love baseball, and I know you've told me this whole time you're better at baseball, but do you want to be a professional athlete? You might be able to make it in baseball, but that's A ball and double A ball and triple A ball, and who knows? Mm -hmm. Like, either you make it in the league or you don't. You can always come back here and play baseball. Coach Toner just like manipulated my mind in like 15 seconds, dude. I was like, all right, done. So I quit the baseball team. 
dude, went out to the pro day, ran a four or five, hit that bench. I don't know, two twenty five, you know, twenty eight times, whatever. Had a nice little vert, ran routes as a tight end from the backfield. I had a really good pro yeah. day, and from that pro day, the Rams worked me out individually. The Vikings worked me out individually. There was a couple other teams, but Coach Zoner from the Vikings and Denny Green from Minnesota just really liked mm-hmm. me. Uh, Coach Green coached at Stanford. R.I.P. to Coach Green. Um, he coached at Stanford. His son played basketball at Santa Cruz High. I think he had a soft spot for a mixed kid like me who reminded me probably of his son who came up in Santa Cruz, probably didn't get all the respect I deserve, but had a chip on my shoulder, um, hard worker. He met me, and he's just like, yeah, you know what? We, we like this kid. You know what I mean? So um, draft day came. No one called. One team called. They offered me $1,000. It was the Minnesota Vikings, dude. So, yeah, I, I took my bus, my, my bus pass, my, my, my flight, my plane flight, right? And uh, went out to Minnesota summer of 97, dude, and I immersed myself in a damn cauldron of just pressure and heat. And you got to think about, like, that team. That team, Chris Carter, Jake Reed, Robert Smith, Leroy Hoare, David Palmer, David Dixon – um, dude, there's Hall of Famers on yeah. that team. Robert Griffith from San Diego State, you know, in 97. So I ended up getting cut and allocated to NFL Europe, which I played in 98. But I came back in 98, made the practice squad, ended up making the roster. And that 98 team was Randy Moss's rookie mm-hmm. year. We went 15-1, and one, went to the NFC Championship game. I played in my first game ever. My first game ever I ever played that year was, guess what, against Baltimore in Baltimore. My first game ever. Little did I know that a year later I would become a Raven, and, and the Raven – is. Being a Raven is all I care about as far as my NFL career. I don't play. I played 11 years, but I'm a Raven. I'm not a Viking. I'm not a Cardinal. I'm not a Dolphin. I'm a Raven, mm-hmm. and that means something. Just like saying Aztecs for life, play like a Raven. It means something to me. I believe purple, dude. And when it comes to the league and the NFL, it is one of the most well-respected organizations um, in in sport. And had I not came up in the cauldron of Minnesota, I would not have been a good Raven. And Coach Billick, who was the coordinator in Minnesota, left to Baltimore as a head coach and took about eight of us with him. And we set the tempo and the tone for what was what has now become what the Baltimore Ravens is, which I was just talking to one of, one of my former teammates, Pete Bursich, on his radio show yesterday, pure coincidence. And I said, people don't know it, but but Dennis Green has had an effect on the Baltimore Ravens culture and what we are as Ravens. And no one knows it because it started with him. Yeah. And then Coach Billick brought it. He, t- he, he talked to Art Modell about it. Art Modell sold the team to Steve Bashotti, mm-hmm. who was the minority owner at that time. Steve Bashotti loved a lot of what Brian's principles were, and him and Ozzy wove that into what Ozzy believed were the right principles, and that combination is the Ravens' foundation. And because of that, the Ravens are one of the most feared and respected teams in the league, and we have a never-say-die attitude. There's an expectation and character traits uh, when it comes to being a Raven. And, dude, I, I love that I'm able to say that, dude, and I feel the same way about being an Aztec, bro. Yeah, man. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, I mean, you weren't just on the Ravens. You first of all, you won a Super Bowl with the Ravens. You got you got that chip, which is which is amazing. Second of all, you know, we're talking the two thousand Ravens, right? I mean, this is this is, you know, arguably the greatest defense in the history of the NFL. I mean, right right up there with the eighty five Bears, right? I think in mo- in most right. conversations. And you know, you you talk a little bit about that culture of the Ravens, and I, I mean, I think it still exists, right? I mean, you know, you know, you play the Ravens, you're 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 in for it. You're you're going to be sore the next morning, right? It's going to be physical. You're going to come up. You know, that's a team that's going to smack you in the mouth. They're not going to back down to anybody. Like I love those like Raven Pittsburgh games, right? I mean, you just know they're going to be so so physical. Um, and I'm assuming that's a little bit of that culture that you're talking about, like how. You know, how, how was that built? What was it like playing in that? And what was that expectation yeah. of a young kid like yourself? Yeah, let, let me let me reverse engineer that for you, because I think it's so relevant to talk about Lamar Jackson right now and what he is. You know, he's the most um, talented football player on the planet right now. And this is a fact, in my opinion. If you watch what he does on a week to week basis, there's nobody doing what Lamar Jackson does. So the Ravens are doing it a bit differently now. They have the number two rated offense in the NFL. The defense is kind of middle of the road, but still a very physical team. Preparing for the Ravens is like preparing for Army or Navy or Air Force. Yes, it's more than running, but they are they just do things differently. From defense, exotic, special teams will hit you in the mouth. Justin Tucker's the best kicker in the league. Um, Greg Roman, the coordinator with the Ravens, and him and Lamar, the scheme that they run is just so hard to stop. And so this idea of never say die, the Ravens have been down double digits four times this season. They're three and one. The rest of the NFL is eight and 93 being down double digits. How do I know this? My side gig 
I'm the Ravens color analyst. Mm -hmm. I do all the Ravens radio games. I travel with the team. I do all my stats stuff. You know, my, as you know, I'm in, I'm in health mm -hmm. uh, care now um, on the digital health kind of healthcare side. And so data and statistics is a big part of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And to do it for football as a side gig, dude, you know, I eat it up, right? So I can give you almost every stat you want to back up what I'm saying. But all I'm saying is, is that this is the 2021 version of the Ravens. It's still a never say die attitude. It's still a go out on your shield mentality. It's just a young guy leading the way now. Now playing with Ray Lewis, um, Ray was my peer and my teammate. And you have to remember that me and Ray are about the same age. And when I came in from Minnesota, I felt like a veteran. I came here in 2000. I'm sorry. I came here in 99. I basically had about two plus years under my belt, plus one year in NFL Europe. I've been through, dude, I've been through the damn, you know, you name it. I've been through it. Right. Um, and so when I got to Baltimore, a team that really wasn't that great in 1999, but found our way toward the end of that season, when 2000 came, I was, I was the starting fullback technically. And, and everyone knows I'm not really a fullback, but the goal here was is to have a guy that could run block, uh, pass block, catch passes, run the football, and could uh, pass protect. And I could do all that stuff. And so it was me and Priest Holmes initially starting in the backfield. Then Priest got uh, – got, um, the job got taken over um, by Jamal Lewis. <clears throat> but Priest and Jamal both carried the ball a ton that year. I was catching balls out of the backfield. You know, we had Shannon Sharp playing tight end, Kadri Ismail at receiver, Tony Banks, Brandon Stokely. But, yes, our defense was no joke. And playing against those guys every day, Jamie Sharper, Ray Lewis, Michael McCrary, Tony Siragusa, Sam Adams, um, Rod Woodson, you know, um, uh, Chris McAllister, Dwayne Starks. Dude, the names just go on, bro. Like ridiculous, ridiculous competition. And if you thought our games were physical, you should have seen us at practice where there was no refs. It was straight mayhem. But we had respect for each other. We took, we took care of each other. But steel sharpened steel. And every day it was a war. So the games were easy. I know that's cliche. Yo, the game is easy. Or you hear MMA fighters. Oh, the fight was easy because my camp was so good. You know what I mean? You hear that all the time, right? But sometimes it's true. Sometimes yeah. the game is easy because practice is so hard. And the way – dude, I didn't even mention Jonathan Ogden, another Hall of oh, yeah. that we have, right? So, you know, have to have the this, this who's who of different players. And we were so tight with the coaches. You know, uh, this is what's funny about high school and, and college. We call our coaches coach in high school and college. I call Brian Billick, Brian. Mm -hmm. I call Denny Green, Denny. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I called my running backs coach, Matt Simon, Matt. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're like partners. You know what That's I mean? Right. We're not, it's not like this hierarchy, this org chart where everyone's below somebody. Yes, of course we know who makes the decisions. We know who's in charge of what, but there's a much more informal kind of business relationship with coaches and front office folks at the NFL level. And it's good that way because you can talk man to man and there's not this fear of like retribution and ass kissing that you have to worry about. And don't get me wrong. There's politics and everything. Well, I guess, I guess the question I, I have is obviously there's like a, there's a mindset there in Baltimore and you know, you, you talk yeah. a little bit about it. It's been there from the beginning. Uh, you know, Denny green, you know, potentially, you know, you kind of mentioned that he was, he was part of putting that in place. Like, but it's continued on. Right. I mean, it's still yeah, there. For sure. Like, yeah, I can tell you why. why. Yeah, I mean, that's what it, I want to know. So check it out. So I don't want people to get crazy when they hear me talk about Denny Green because his influence is subtle and indirect yeah. because it came through Brian, which then came through Ozzy, which then came through Art and Steve Bashotti, sure. but maybe almost unbeknownst to them. But I see it because I'm one of the only people that was there for all of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I have a very unique view and I'm still viewing it. And you have to remember, too, that my brother played for the Ravens for right. five years. We're a trivia question. Who are the only brothers in Ravens history to both have Super Bowl rings with yeah. the Ravens? Brendan and Femi Ayan Badeja, right? He was there from 2008 to 2012. Mm -hmm. I was there from 2009 to 2001. Both uh, 1999 to 2001, we both happened to be there during Super Bowl runs, right? So, you know, I've had a bird's eye view. And another thing that I got to see that a lot of people don't know is I got to be an intern under Coach Harbaugh. Yeah. When I retired in 2010... I had, a, I had two dreams, one to either become a human performance expert, which is what I ended mm -hmm. up doing, or become an NFL coach. Now, trust me, I tried to become an NFL coach. That's not as easy as it sounds because, truth be told, there's a lot of good – there's a lot of things that have to go your way to make that happen. Interesting. Right? I thought I had the right path to make that happen. I got to intern under Coach Harbaugh. Ultimately, it didn't happen, but I got to learn 
and watch Coach Harbaugh. I got to sit in in the meetings. You know the, those meetings where they talk about each player, like each yeah, position yeah. coach goes through each player and grades them each day? Bro, that shit is real. Sure. They're really talking about you that, like, the way you think they are, they are. Yeah. Like, so-and-so had a real good day today. He did a good job. Yeah, he had good balance. Yeah, he kept his hands inside on the block. Oh, no, he's shitty. He fell down. He has no balance. He's got work to do. I don't know if he's going to make it. I might want to – they really talk sure. that way. You know, and I got to watch that. And what I appreciate about that is that they allowed me to sit in. They had enough faith in me without even telling me, like, look, dude, we know your brother's on this team, but you can't, like, come out of this room and go share what we talk about. They never even told me not to do that. Just I just knew. knew yeah. I just knew that I'm not supposed mm -hmm. to, you know what I mean? And if I wanted to be a coach for the Ravens at some point, obviously I couldn't. I, they had to be able to trust me. Now, if you have to tell me that if you want me to trust you, you can't do this, then obviously I'm not the right guy for the job, right? You know. So anyway, I got to see so many levels. It's almost funny. As we talk and, and I think through the, generation, the generations of Ravens, from me, there was a gap between my brother and I being Ravens. Then there was my brother. And I was still playing in the NFL at that time, so I didn't give a damn about the Ravens for, for a while there. Then my brother became a Raven. He was there for five years. I got to become a coaching intern. I moved back to Maryland did my MBA at Johns Hopkins. Obviously there was a ton of things that happened in me building this new version of myself mm -hmm. as a human performance expert, certified nutritionist, personal trainer, gym owner, pivoting to AI and digital technology. I did all that through Hopkins, but while being at Hopkins, I got this real close view of the Ravens still because Dick Cass, this goes, this is what's gonna answer your question about why it's, why it's maintained. Dick Cass is the team president. He was brought in by Steve Bashotti. Steve Bashotti had an expectation and the type of guy he wanted at president. Dick Gass, Cass, who's an attorney, fits that role. Um, Ozzie has been here the whole time. Eric DaCosta, who is the current GM, was a scout when I played for the Ravens. Now he's the GM, okay? Mm -hmm. There's a guy named Joe Douglas. He's the GM for the Jets now, okay? So what I'm saying is, is that these guys that grew up here in Baltimore that were had these different positions, they're often being GMs now. Some of them have already become head coaches other places. You know, think about all the guys, you know, Jack Del Rio, uh, Greg Smith. Um, I'm trying to remember uh, Marvin. Uh, Lewis. What's Marvin's last Marvin name? Lewis. Marvin Lewis. Marvin Lewis was a defensive coordinator when I played. These guys all went on to be head coaches. Some of these guys have been out. They've moved on to TV and other things now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're, they're out of football, some of them. But my point ultimately is, is that. What made the Ravens the Ravens, starting back to, to Coach Billick, is that a lot of those guys are still in the building. And those expectations through, like, the storytelling and through uh, cultural expectations and, you know, being honest and upfront about what it means to be a Raven and talking about the guys that came before them. And then there's a big ass sign in the Ravens locker room that says, play like a Raven. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't, there's no other place that I can think of other than the Raiders um, that says the Raiders theme is commitment to excellence, mm -hmm. isn't it? I think it's commitment to excellence. They're the only other team that I know of that has a motto other than the Ravens, but fuck the Raiders though. You know what I'm saying? And I don't, I'm not saying that because of what's been happening lately, just in general, yeah. just like, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm a Raven. I don't give a yeah, damn about anybody you, else. You know what I'm saying? So I'm saying it just that way because of not the Gruden in, in, uh, situation or the rug situation. Those are sad, unfortunate mm -hmm. things. And I, and I hope, those, both those gentlemen have a second chance to rectify their lives for completely different reasons, but I digress. My point is ultimately is that there's a lot of teams around the NFL that I could give a damn sure. about. Now, I respect every NFL player. I respect every athlete that goes out there and balls. But when, you come, when you're a Raven and you put it out there as a Raven on that field and you win games on that field under – under the guise of what's expected in this culture, dude, I got a lot of love for those guys because those are like my brothers, just like the Aztecs. You know yeah. what I mean? We we have a thing the way that we do things. So it's just I can I know I'm being really effusive and super gushy about it, but you know now that I'm doing the the Ravens radio broadcast, I'm part of this generation mm -hmm. too. You know what I mean? Like I'm still I'm still involved. I, no matter how, how how I try to get away, dude, they pull me back in. That's right. You know? They just keep. <laughs> they pull me back into some role. When I when I moved back here to go to Johns Hopkins and do my MBA, I did it to reinvent myself to be taken seriously by going to one of the best universities on the planet. You know what I mean? I had one of the things that motivates me, Greg, is that when people tell me that I can't do something, I go, fuck you, yeah. watch me. You know what I mean? I literally love it when people tell me I feed off of negative energy. I don't like it. I don't like toxicity, but I turn it into fuel. That's right. 
When someone tells me some shit that about me and then goes, oh, you're not smart enough to do that. You're not good enough They'll to do that. You'll me. never do that. I go, really? Let me write. I'm taking names right. and quotes. And I'm putting them in my figurative back pocket. You know what I mean? And so, where, where, so, so take what, a step out. Where, where does that chip come from? You, t- you, you used that word earlier in the conversation, kind of had a chip on your shoulder. Um, you know, you, yeah. you think, do you think it was just being so young growing up that you were always a little bit behind and you had to try to catch up physically yeah. or. Yeah, I don't I, see. I don't think it's that. I think that. So if we go back a little further and there's things here that you don't even know about me, like my father came to the U S from Nigeria. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm half Nigerian, half Irish. My father came here as an immigrant. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And he met my mom in Chicago and they got married, had my brother and I, we moved back to Nigeria. We lived in a house with no electricity and no running water for a long time. This is Nigeria in the seventies, yeah. bro, third world country. And so my mom being the only white face for miles, right? She had to figure out how to survive in a place that was not normal mm-hmm. for, for compared to what she's used to. She's from Chicago, Illinois. You know yeah. what I mean? South side of Chicago. She, she grew up in an Irish Catholic environment that was very different than growing up in Lagos, Nigeria. And if my dad was more supportive, we probably would have stayed in Nigeria, but he wasn't very supportive. So eventually under the guise of night, we snuck out of the country, dude. And we left Nigeria, left all our shit there, just came back with like whatever bag my mom had with our stuff in it and moved back to Chicago. She's had and, enough. And how, of it. how old you are you at this time? I was three. Okay. My brother was one. Yeah. But I remember a lot of things from sure. that time, a lot of memories, you know? And the problem is, is that my mom came back to nothing. Her parents basically were, had passed away um, prior to her leaving both of them. And her parents were very supportive of my brother and mm-hmm. I, there's not a lot of half Nigerian Irish kids in Chicago in the seventies, by the way, uh, Chicago has a very racist history, dude. It yeah. really does. Um, and obviously, luckily for us, we live in the 2020s now where things are much, much, much better uh, as a whole around the country. Things are much better, but ultimately um, better, not good enough, but better. Let me say mm-hmm. that. Um, but um, my mom ended up scrawling in, in uh, cratching and in, in scratching and crawling her way through things Eventually, you know, we were on welfare. We ended up moving into a housing project in Chicago called Lathrop Homes Projects. But my mom found a way to get us into a a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. We got offered a scholarship to the school, pure luck, right place, right time, right family. Mm -hmm. Got a scholarship to this Catholic school that was down the street. We didn't have to go to the public school that was in the housing project. So we got a great education. I ended up skipping fourth grade because I tested out of it due to this scholastic, Iowa basic skills scholastic test that they had. Like I was in third grade getting like crazy scores. So my mom thought, oh, this is a this is a great thing for my son to be this smart kid. But she didn't realize that it hurts me athletically. Now, nobody would know I was the young, youngest kid in that class because I didn't look like it and I didn't act like it. You know, I was a little bigger than than I was bigger than kids my sure. own age and probably more mature than kids my own age. But as you get older, those things start to become, you know, when I'm 12 in Little League, and I'm smashing in little league, but then I go and I'm in eighth grade playing basketball. I, you know, that, that, that's not congruent. Right. You know what I mean? You have kids that have got a little bass in their voice and little mustaches and I'm still prepubescent. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just weird. Right now as time goes on, I close that gap a little bit, but I think it gave me that chip yeah. on my shoulder. It always made me feel like these, like this, this kid is playing eighth grade basketball with me. He's supposed to be in ninth grade. I'm supposed to be in seventh grade. And he thinks it's cool that he just beat me. You know what I mean? Or he just got me somehow. He doesn't realize I'm two years older or two years younger than him. You know yeah. what I mean? And I think that disadvantage that I had, I turned it into an advantage in my mind. And that's why I think I feed off the negativity sometimes, the doubt. And when I say negativity, like I don't like anything toxic. I don't want people saying and calling me things that they shouldn't. I just mean that I like it when people doubt me. I like it when people underestimate yeah, motivates me. You. And I turn that into fuel. So that that chip that I have goes all the way back probably to, you know, living in Nigeria with fucking nothing, dude. And coming back to Chicago, living in a housing project and being saved by a place like Santa Cruz, where my stepdad basically was like, Look, we're all getting out of here. We're all going to Santa Cruz and it's gonna change all our lives. And guess what, dude? It completely did. So that's a that's a quick summary on a lot of wild shit that happened, but that's that's the real deal. Yeah, no, it's, the, the the reason I asked that, in, and I, I love to ask that question because I, you know, I always feel like I I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. Now my background isn't uh, as as extreme as your background, but you know, like my parents, my mom uh, immigrated here. My dad is is non college educated, drafted Vietnam vet, like. 
uh, you know, blue collar type of uh, upbringing, ended up growing up in a nice suburb and those types of things. But, you know, there were a lot of people around me that had things that I didn't have. And, you know, I know yeah. it pushed me and I know it's something that still drives me. And I, and I think similar to you, like, um, I'm, I'm motivated a lot by, by, by kind of the same thing you said, like, I'm going to show you what I can do. And, 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 yeah. and I think that's a theme that's coming out in a lot of these conversations I'm having. And, and you see it with, with, with athletes, you see it with entrepreneurs, uh, you know, I think it's high, high achievers in general. And, and, you know, I, I, the conversation I have with, with, with my wife about my kids, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, you know, with your kids is, yeah. Our kids are growing up with different backgrounds than we grew up with, right? Like, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you said you were born in a situation you didn't have running water, right? And I'm, I'm sure that you know, with with your kids, it's it's, it's a very different story. So, yeah, <laughs> and, and the same with mine, right? And you know, how do you have them have a little chip on their shoulder, right? You don't want life to be too comfortable. You need a little adversity, you know. So I don't know. Have you have you ever put anything? They can't imagine me. Like when I tell them I never had more than $5 in my pocket until I was a teenager, they can't even envision that. You know, like my son, just from his birthday and his 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 graduation from eighth grade, he's got like $1,200 in his bank account, dude. Like it's insane. You know sure. what I mean? Like I, I just, I look at him and then and then he calls me and asks me to order him Uber Eats. I'm like, bro, you got $1,200 in your bank account and you want me to order you Uber Eats? And what do I do? I, I order him Uber Eats, dude. Right? I know what an asshole I am. I'm not, I'm not teaching them how to be tough enough, right? But what I do, honestly, though, and what I think is super helpful, so I have a 16-year-old daughter who's just about to turn 17. She's actually in L.A. in a modeling shoot right yeah. now. She works with – she signed a contract with L.A. Models like a year ago, dude, which is wild. Yeah. She's flying around the country, supervised. My brother lives in L.A. As you know, he went to mm -hmm. UCLA. So luckily, I have him there and his wife to watch over her while she's working in L.A. His niece is the same age as my daughter, so they're super, super close. They've been around each other since they were babies. I'm so lucky to have the family that I have now. My brother's story is very similar to my yeah, story, course. right? You know what I mean? UCLA, Cabrillo, 10 years in the NFL, ring with the Ravens, et cetera. Three, he has three kids. I have three kids. And we both talk all the time about how lucky our kids have it, but we we know that it's not their fault that we were born into poverty and they were born into upper middle class or more environment. That's not their fault. Yeah. So it's really unfair for us to use our disadvantages as something that we hang over their heads. I, I don't like to do that. What I like to do is do an apples to apples comparison for them and say, like, look, dude, what do you think you need to do to reach this mm -hmm. goal? Because I can't go out there and shoot that ball for you. I can't go out there and catch it for you. But what I can do is teach you um, in a way that a lot of dads, moms, coaches, these are the people that helped me. My, my parents weren't always around to help me, but a lot of people invested in me. And I got lucky. And those people were as close to being a parent as they could have been because what they were giving me was as good as they could give as if I was their own child. So I'm lucky enough to be able to give it to my kids. And what I try to do is never give them anything just for the sake of giving it to them. I try to apply some critical thinking and get them to think their way through the process on what the right way is to go about mm -hmm. it. And I, I would say from, especially with my son, who's a super athlete, you know, I coached his flag football teams. No joke. I would not let him play tackle. He played tackle this year, really his first year playing as a freshman. Not that great right now. Really good athlete, but doesn't know how to hit, doesn't know how to take a hit. He's figuring it mm -hmm. out. But I had to figure it out, and I didn't have a dad to show me how to yeah. do that. So I 100% believe that he'll figure it out because he has no choice. You know what I mean? If I figured it out, he'll be able to figure it out. So there's some, there's some calmness in this because I know I had much less, and I figured yeah. it out. So what I try to do is tell him about my stories and that he'll learn and he'll figure it out, but that he's got to put the time in. Instead of playing PlayStation and all this other stuff that you do, you should be out on the basketball court. Mom has a 10-foot hoop in front of the house that I paid for. There's a black top right there. You can be out there shooting. Um, I'll, I'll throw you routes. We'll run routes. We'll talk about different route combinations. I'll, show, I'll put you through the whole route tree, which I do all mm -hmm. the time. Like I said, I coach this flag spring and fall, dude, for like five years. He played like 10 years of flag football. You know what I mean? Even had my daughter out there playing. Yeah. So those are the times where I can just coach. And I'm dad still, but when I'm coaching, I'm just coaching. So a lot of those things that I was taught, I get to kind of indirect, indirectly, passive, aggressively drop on them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hey, I'm not dad. I'm just coaching sure. right now. You know what I mean? So, and, I'm, and I'm coaching all the kids the same way. So, you know, I think that it's important for me that they earn what they get and they understand that there is – investment that has to be paid to get a return and that return is success making the team becoming a starter but that investment is all that time that no one sees 
that you've got to put in. And I think that's where the disconnect is with a lot of kids right now is they, they watch NB, the NBA, they watch Steph Curry, they watch Lamar, you know, uh, uh, they, they watch, you know, uh, I'm a big Giants fan. They watch Brandon Crawford play shortstop for the Giants. And they just think, oh, this, these guys are the best and it's easy. No, it's not easy. There's thousands and thousands of hours that went into them crafting their game. And you're not going to get better playing PlayStation. And what I'll say is this. Our kids are, in my opinion, are way smarter than us, book smarter than us, because like, I think my son was taking algebra two in eighth grade. I took algebra two in high school and I was a good student. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? My daughter is taking pre-calc as a junior. Like that's insane. I think I took pre-calc as a senior. I, wait, I'm not even sure if I took it to be honest. Like I, and once again, I was a good student. The, what this, what the, the, the education system, especially when you go to a private school, like my kids go to, it is off the chart expectations and guess what? They're thriving. What I worry about is what COVID did from a social learning perspective. And everything can't be a text message. It can't be um, a hand gesture or gesture or an emoji. It can't be, it can't be a, a, an email. Like sometimes you've got to talk to somebody face to face. You've got to pick up the phone and have a real conversation. That's where my concern really is for our kids. It's not their intelligence. It's not their self-awareness. It's not their inability to speak out. They can do all that shit, bro. They're, they have no problem with that. For me, it's the interpersonal yeah. people skills, the empathy. They have empathy, but there's a certain disconnect on what commu real communication is. Yeah. And for me, that's the thing that I, that I harp on the most. And that's where I think as a parent, I go in trying to, if I can impart anything that from that I think we did better as kids, it's that kind of like in face, in person, kicking it, hanging out together. Not everything is through some virtual platform where we're all 10 of us in a thread and doing these disconnected things. It was in person together. So I try to focus more on that because like I said, to, to tie a knot around this, me thinking that my childhood and the struggles that I went through are relevant to them at all other than a good story, I think is futile. I, yeah, no, I agree. And I think that's one of the reasons, you know, you talk a little bit about the social side of it and it's, it's just so obvious, right? I mean, everything's digital. I have a, a friend I was talking to the other day and it's his kids aren't really athletes. And he, he was, he was saying that they get home from school and that they're social, but even with the neighbor's kids, they all go up into their rooms and then they just connect on like digital, right? Uh, exactly. It's crazy. On PS, they're talking on yeah. PS4. Where, where if you play a sport, you know, my daughters play uh, softball, I play volleyball, you know, whatever it is, yeah. that can't be done digitally. It's like the one thing that it's like, she shows up for practice and she is around a bunch of real people and she's forced yeah. to interact. And, and, and I think that is important, you know, and I think, I think the sports kind of helps bring people together. So Greg, I, th I think you're hitting on a real, like something I want to bring real explicit attention to sports still bring people together mm -hmm. sports still is something that you cannot replicate it has to be done in person it has to be real and i'll tell you this my 15 year old son his name is femi he's a freshman in high school i've been talking about him this whole time i'm so impressed with how he has kind of rethought his priorities on where he needs to spend his time i didn't need to tell him i didn't need to ask him he realized on his own that he loves going to MMA practice. He's been doing that for two years. Mm -hmm. He does jujitsu and Muay Thai. He loves it. He played football for the first time. After the first week of training camp, he wanted to quit. And I said, dude, if you quit, you're gonna go turn in your pads. You're gonna tell your coach, thanks for the opportunity. And you're gonna tell him why you're quitting. Do you have an answer for that? Sorta, I wanna go back to MMA. Well, MMA is not going anywhere. And, and, and yeah, you could be an MMA fighter too. Like I'm not worried about that, but, it, but do you really wanna give up on football now? And it's not because I played, I just know how good it is to go through that grueling process. Once you go through camp, dude, it's cakewalk. In your freshman year, there's nothing harder than your freshman mm -hmm. year of high school football, your first training camp. And they don't do double days, dude. No, like, it's not real now. double days. Yeah. I mean, they, they definitely have pads one, once a day, and then they have like a walkthrough, which I'm all for. I'm all for player safety. I'm all for player safety more than I am for good tackling. I really am. Like, oh, they don't tackle, they don't hit. That's another story for another day. But my point ultimately is, is that I still think that there are some core interpersonal communication learnings that you can apply through life 
just from surviving a training camp for a month with other kids. Like you're going to fight with other kids. You're going to argue. You're going to hate it, but you're going to get through it and you're going to be better for it. I don't, I didn't phrase that all. No, you, know, right you did. And, and I don't want to speak for you, but I've, I've had this conversation with other people on the show. And I, I think it's an important component of, of what this is all about. You know, I, I mean, look, you, you are an undrafted free agent. You're at camp. It's like, welcome to the NFL. You're surrounded by people that you've been watching on TV since you were a little kid, future hall of famers. It's a job. It's a business. You know, you're fighting for your livelihood. Like you talk about pressure, like that's pressure, right? Like that's, that's stress. I'm sure, you know, and we'll get into your, uh, I want to get into health real a little bit later. Like you got an investor meeting or you have a potential a partnership meeting, like, yeah, you're a little nervous and yeah, you want to do well. But I mean, after this, the pressure and the stress that you've lived through your life through athletics, right? All that stuff kind of seems a little bit easy, right? I mean. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. I think that um, competing at a high level, competing as a division one athlete, competing as a professional athlete, dude, like uh, I am so loose and chill when I meet people like, and we'll get, like you said, we'll get into health real, but like, dude, I have, I have conversations. I sat down with people at Apple. I have buddies that work at Google. You know, um, I have a contract, an MOU, an MOU, it's not signed yet, but with Fitbit, um, I have an MOU with a company called Melitic. These are some of the best tech companies in the world, dude. And I have zero, zero stress over having the, the real business conversation because I'm prepared um, about what things, what needs to happen. Like no one's going to punch me. No one's going to hit me. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to get tired. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm not, my life's not at risk per, for, you know, per se. Um, so absolutely. I think that being, being a, a, an athlete and competing and the physicality of football and the cerebralness of digesting a playbook and understanding all the things that it takes, the preparation, the training, the dude, dude, getting up at whatever time we used to run during the spring at like what six mm -hmm. in the morning to do gassers and shit because we were in Tijuana the night before. Remember when we had to do those Wednesday morning runs and we go to TJ like Tuesday, like Tuesday night. But just you know, but that was all camaraderie. That was all part of the learning That's process. Right. So you know, I think that, I think that for me, um, and you you bring up like real fear. Yeah, my first day of practice, dude, was wild in Minnesota. And John Randall, who is a Hall of mm -hmm. Famer. Uh, he was an undrafted free agent, Minnesota Viking Hall of Famer. My very, very, very first day of practice, I get on the field. And, we, it, it, and you got to remember, it's cold in Minnesota at this time of year during our first mini camp. I want to say it was like April. Maybe it was – Maybe I, I want to say it was April then at that time because I think the draft was a little bit earlier. And I remember um, we were at Winter Park in Eden Prairie, which is right outside of Minnesota, but that's where the home base is for the Vikings or was at the time. It's somewhere else now. But I got out there early, as my coach told me to. I would do. I had the cleanest white, like cleats on. I had my number ugly ass forty nine jersey on because that's all they had left for me. And I'm doing my lap around the the, the field, and I just hear this dude like running really hard. And I'm, and I'm not going to look behind me because I don't know why I'm not going to. I'm just not going to look behind me, carrying a football. And this dude comes up from behind me, just strips the football, and then proceeds to cuss me out. And Rook, you better hold on to that football, Rook. You think, do you think that's a loaf of bread? This isn't San Diego State. Like, he already knew who sure. I was and everything. He's like, I'm going to be testing you all day, and I better not see you carrying that ball like that again. I'm going to do the exact same shit all day to you, you know? That was my first freaking lap around Winter Park. <clears throat> John Randall, that was his way of introducing me to the league. But you know what's so funny is I became very close with John Randall uh, over the years, and I learned – I earned his respect mm -hmm. over time. And – to this day, we talk on LinkedIn. I went back to Minneapolis. The only other t the only other time I've gone to a non Raven event was the nineteen ninety eight uh, twenty year reunion. Um, I went back there, and there was like thirty five of us that showed up for that, which was amazing at the new stadium in Minneapolis. And John was there. We smoked cigars, we drank whiskey, we talked about all the old school stuff that we used to do. We do. We used to go out after games. I mean, I'd, I'd earned so much respect from him. He used to bring me out with him sometimes after games. And one of the other things that was super cool, and the only reason why I'm remembering all this is because I was on that call yesterday with Pete Bursich, who's a former Viking who I played with as mm -hmm. well. And he's like, what was that nickname they used to call you um, in Minnesota? I'm like, um, all the reps today, yo, because Ayan Badejo, they'd, be, they'd yeah. call me all the reps today, yo. Because on Friday, uh, before our Sunday game, I was the only run, young running back that probably wasn't going to suit up. So I would do all the reps, and I loved it. If I didn't have all those reps, dude, 
I would not have played one year, let alone 11 years in the league. They let me go, and I did everything against the ones, with the ones, and the coaches trusted me, and the running backs trusted me. And then that nickname stuck, all the reps today, yo. So they would come in on Friday. I'd have to bring in their food, and they'd be like, we know who, we know who got all the reps today, yo. <laughs> you know, what I mean? that was like an ongoing joke and it stuck. And it's kind of funny how these little things that I almost forget sometimes, but those guys that were around remember, and they have to remind me like what I did or like how they remembered me or, you know, we all have a little bit of a different memory of people from our little different angle. And I was sharing with Pete, like my memory of him. And he was one of the first players. He was a linebacker drafted in the seventh round out of Notre Dame in 1994. And he was the first guy that ever pulled me aside and said, yo, you got to slow your ass down. Like, we're playing Sunday. You got all the reps today, yo, but you're going too fast. Like, you need to chill out. You know what I mean? And I remembered that. And I never forgot that. And I reminded him of that. And he's like, I don't remember even saying that to you. He's like, I always had respect for how hard you worked. I go, but yeah, but this particular day you were pissed. He's like, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. That's typical stuff. But that's the lead. What, what, was his perspective that you need to slow down because we all have to play and like, you know, you're like, you can't like put us in a bad situation, that type of thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. It was like, hey, there's only 53 of us and only 47 of us are going to suit up. And, like, we need every one of us. And we get that this is your game, but, like, we're practicing. And we don't mind you going 100 because we're not – like, Fridays, remember, you know, we're in sure. shells. Like, we're not even in pads. It's just shells and helmets, right, the soft shells. And so – but I would go hard, dude. Like, every week, yeah. you know, I, I would – you know, I if I was playing Mike Allstott, because, you know, mm -hmm. remember the Tampa and – and the, and the Raven, uh, Tampa and the Vikings had a real big rivalry back then. I would be Mike Allstott some weeks. Remember, Mike Allstott would play tailback and fullback, yeah. right, with work done. Uh, it, was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was work done. And so one back would play like David Palmer would be work done. I'd be Mike Allstott. So I'd get a ton of reps. So, you know, I'd be juiced up all week just ready to give my look. And then when Friday would come, it would be more about like the offense doing the offense. And I would get those reps too. Like they would trip. I would do the, the look team and then I would do our offense. It would be awesome. You know, I loved it. That was like literally like my time to shine. And I think those reps in front of those coaches against our defense, like those guys all remembered me later because of that. You know what I'm saying? So it, it was awesome. I loved it. That's right, man. And that's, that's how you, that's how you end up making a team as an undrafted free agent and how you end up playing, you know, 11 years of professional football. Right. Yep. Uh, sure. So I, I want to talk quickly about your NBA. Uh, I, I did something yeah. similar, um, you know, probably about the same age, uh, decided to go back, felt like there were a couple gaps in, you know, my knowledge base uh, that I wanted to fill. Uh, did you go to USC? I, I went through the USC program. Uh, yeah, I remember when you were, I, I feel like I remember you going through it. And I think we talked briefly, yeah. like kind of at that time. And I remember being so proud of you, dude, because I remember thinking like, that's a smart ass dude. Doing yeah, that. I appreciate that, man. I felt the same way when I was, you know, tracking your your journey going through Johns Hopkins. So what, uh, what, what was that decision process like? Yeah, you know, I think, um, and, and you, I won't speak for you on this, but I got sick of being like the shiny object in the room. You know, you played with Emmett? Yeah, I caught a touchdown pass for Emmett. Cool. You played with, with Randy Moss? Yeah. You played with Edwin James? Yeah. Man, you play, You have a Super Bowl? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about business. I'm here to talk about how I can help your company. Okay. Well, what's your degree in psychology? Well, what have you done with that? Um, I played 11 years in the NFL. Okay. Well, that's why we're talking about the NFL because that's not really a role for you. Hmm. Here. You know what I mean? That's like literally, that's a, that's a very short cut version of the conversation. You know what I mean? I thought the way that I looked at it, I never wanted to be handed anything, but I felt like I'm smart, I'm a hard worker, I'll learn things, and if you just give me a chance and bring me into your organization, whether it was real estate or you know, retail, or there were so many different things I was willing to try, but nobody really wanted to give me a chance. So I just thought, you know what? I love exercise, I love fitness. Um, you know, I, I'm passionate about nutrition, sleep hygiene, Eastern philosophy, medicine, and I just had an epiphany, like, it makes sense for me to go down this, this fitness and wellness path because it's up to me. As an entrepreneur, I can do that. And so um, when I officially retired in 2010, I opened up a training facility in La Jolla because I've been basically been living in San Diego from 95 all the way up until 2014 when I left. And I had a great um, relationship with the community. People trusted me. People knew me. And... To this day, anyone knows that anything I do, I'm not going to half step or bullshit my way through it. If I don't know, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to learn it and then I'm going to mm -hmm. talk about it. So a couple of partners, my personal trainer, 
his wife, who was also a personal trainer, they all trained at the Aztec Re Recreation Center where I worked out all the way through my NFL career, basically. Uh, we decided to, to lease a spot in downtown La Jolla. We hired a contractor, dude. We did it from soup to nuts, bro. We, we, we did the demo, hired someone to do the demo, bought all the equipment, hired trainers. So I went through basically like a crash course, a crash course in business and business development and strategy and scaling like literally in like a six month window, you know, like, and I was like enjoying it, you know? And so in my mind, I had, well, I had all that was required to be a good personal trainer, but I, I needed to get my credential, which I got eventually my certification. Mm -hmm. And I hit the ground running, dude. I started making probably like, you know, two or three grand a month. And before I knew it, I was making like 14, 15 grand a month personal training. You know what I mean? I was training kids, speed and agility camps, boot camps. I would be in at 6 a.m. doing a boot camp. I would leave at 6 p.m. or I would leave at 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. after doing a 6 p.m. boot camp. And I would have, you know, seven, eight, nine clients. I was giving other trainers clients. I was, I was stealing other trainers from other facilities in La Jolla, bringing them to our gym. So we were rocking and rolling. And then I had an epiphany. I got a Fitbit and I was like, this is cool. I'm still rocking a Fitbit now, actually. I go, I got a Fitbit and I was like, what, like, what is this going to do for people? Like when it comes to like the like cognitive behavioral stuff, like, is this going to actually motivate somebody to do something differently? Like counting steps. Cause the early model Fitbits didn't really do much. It was like steps and distance. There was no heart rate. There was no active metabolic rate. There was no adding nutrition or any of that stuff, but it was pretty cool though. Still. So eventually I was like, why would I work with a hundred people or 300 people when I could work with a hundred thousand or 300,000, I started seeing what applications could become. And I saw it really early and it was very clear in my head what I needed to do. So that right around 2011 is when all this stuff really started getting into my head in 2012, I ended up doing, um, a entrepreneurial one week immersion program at Stanford through the NFL. They do it at a business school every year. Happened to be at Stanford this particular year. When you go to Stanford's business school, one of the best in the world, how can you not leave there feeling like I want to get my MBA? And our keynote speaker, dude, which is wild as hell, was Condoleezza Rice. Oh, sick. Condoleezza Rice, yeah, right? Condoleezza Rice and I talked for an hour afterward. And she's like, you know, just getting to the, like the thick of the conversation. She's like, why are you here? Like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I think I, I think I want to go back to school. I, th I think I want to get into the digital side of, of this kind of healthcare stuff that's happening. And then she started picking my brain. And, and before you knew it, dude, like to make a long story short with her and I, we talked for, like I said, about an hour. And she's like, it sounds like you need to go to grad school. Sounds like you want, and it sounds like you want to come here. And I was like, absolutely. But I had two kids at that point, you know, going to Stanford would have been selfish. So the first thing I had to do was unwind myself from my business in La Jolla. I had to tell my trainers, I had to tell my clients, I had to tell my partners. And I said, I'm going to give it a year. I'm going to unwind myself in a year in a very transparent, kind way. I'll sell my ownership and equity piece to somebody else. One of my buddies ended up buying it from me. And in 2013, I enrolled back at SDSU and I studied microeconomics, dude. And I started looking at business schools. And when these business schools saw that I had preemptively enrolled back in school to like make sure I was ready. They loved it. Talked to Georgetown, University of Maryland. And the reason why I chose a school in Maryland is because my old, my kids were here. Had I gone to Stanford or UCLA or back to SDSU, how does that help my kids? I wanted to be around my kids more. So that's why I chose Hopkins. And to be honest, other than Stanford, none of these other schools had a bigger name than Hopkins mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. They didn't. You know, like when I talk about Hopkins, everyone's eyes light up like, and guess what? Of course, what they say, you're not getting into Hopkins, bro. I was like, watch oh, me. Okay. Love it. Watch me. So in 2014, I got into Hopkins, jumped into a full-time executive MBA program. There was 25 of us in my cohort, 10 fucking doctors, bro. 10 doctors, like eight VPs of BD and like me. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I'm like the, I'm like the black sheep, literally, literally and figuratively. <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's funny because no one else had my background. You know what I mean? But dude, I went toe to toe. Like we would have massive crazy debates and it was awesome. Uh, it was 10, 10, it was like 10 sessions on campus for seven days or eight days in a row. And then the rest of it was kind of like asynchronous group work. And then we had one 
um, out of the country trip we had to do and solve some uh, like problem in another country somewhere. We went to Ecuador actually. I, I'm making I'm not making it sound very glamorous or very great, but it was amazing. But um, that was the program. It was a 20 month full full time program, and yeah, and I used that time to flesh out the concept for Health Real. And really, what I really wanted for Health Real was a program that took some of what we get as professional athletes, which is that detailed analysis of our body composition and our nutrition and our exercise and our sleep hygiene and our mental health. And if, I know that all these things weren't big buzzwords when you and I were in college, but indirectly, we all kind of knew that all these things played a part. But it, as I got into the NFL, these things became really big, gut health and metabolic typing. I had a PhD in this stuff, dude, because if you mentioned anything that gave me an advantage, I was studying it. I was trying it like all day long, you know, supplementation. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, um, the gut health stuff and the food sensitivity stuff, I was so big on and I, it was so important to me. And I, I got really good at, at really understanding what foods worked for me. And I believed that I could build a platform that I could give everybody that advantage that I had. And that was really the kind of bud concept for health real. And I used Johns Hopkins as a safe space in that bubble to flesh out all my concepts and all my ideas. Some of them are really shitty, but guess what? I got A's failing, if that makes sense. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that these, some of the business concepts were failures, but I got great grades making my, my business case or, you know, better understanding and, uh, you know, better understanding the coursework and excelling at the coursework, although maybe my idea wasn't that great. But by the time I left, I had a really good proof of concept. I knew what direction I wanted to go in. And one of the best things that happened in my last quarter at Hopkins was I got introduced to NASA. There's a NASA lab right here in Greenbelt, Maryland called NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And I'm the first athlete in history, retired or active, to ever sign an exclusive licensing agreement to license um, an algorithm from NASA, and I embedded it into my Health Real platform. Now, once again, the platform's not done yet. We're still in beta. We've done plenty of fundraising. We have an active beta right now that's free. Uh, covers a ton of different biometric data, gives some really good recommendations right now from mental health to body fat percentage to ideal healthy body weight to macronutrient splits to um, are you in the green or the red on depression, anxiety, and stress. Like my goal is to have a one-stop shop platform that on one side is, is direct to consumer and on the other, we have a B2B2C platform. So think of the Uber app, mm -hmm. right? And think of Uber Eats even, where on one side you have the driver and on the other side you have the passenger. Yeah. Well, guess what? You have limes too, where you don't need a driver. You just go get a lime and you hop on a lime and you, do, and you kind of just go do your own thing. Well, that's what Health Real is. We have a version that's direct to consumer. You don't need to have a trainer or anyone help you. And then we have another one where we're actually supporting the trainers and their clients. We're allowing the trainers to get some advantage over the competition by doing all the heavy lifting in regard to the biometrics for their clients and really allowing them to have a platform like how you and I are talking, they can do the exact same thing with the assessment and the data right on screen. I know I'm glossing over it a little bit, but that's really the, the foundation of what Health Real is, is gonna be. And one other thing, one other cool thing I wanna tell you is right now we're working on using AI and a neural network to project A1C. And for those that don't know, A1C is kind of the biomarker that they use in blood glucose to detect type 2 diabetes. We might be able to do it with a video from a user. We're working on that right now with the University of North Carolina. Yeah, dude. So we're doing some dope, crazy, cutting-edge stuff. So, uh, yeah, the technology looks amazing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited for the product. Uh, and for people who don't know, I mean, a lot of this is done through video, right? I mean, you, you, you open up the app, yeah. you take, uh, what, the 10 second video of yourself yeah. and then using different AI and different algorithms, you're able to, you know, pr provide, provide this kind of data. Uh, are you, you know, you talked a little bit about Fitbit earlier. Is, is that plans for it too, to be able to take sort of like real time biometric data as well and to feed that into the app? Yeah. So, um, so what we do basically is we, we gather some demographic data on the user. We gather some self-reported data on the user and we have them upload a video. And then we're able to produce like a 20 point assessment with current health states and then recommendations on health, healthy health states. Um, I won't go down a rabbit hole explaining that, but anybody can go to healthreal.com. And if you have an, an, an iPhone, you have to download test flight 
Um, the app will prompt you to do that, but you can use it for free. If you have a, an Android, um, you can just go right to the Google Play Store uh, or my website and download it uh, that way. It's free, no codes needed, you know, no OTP, nothing. You can just literally use it, no problem, free. Um, so once we gather all this data, you know, the goal here is to share stuff with, with the, the users so they have some idea on, you know, what a caloric deficit looks like, which is how you lose weight, understanding how unhealthy they might be and how being over, overweight or obese leads to type 2 diabetes, which then leads to kind of, you know, a, a quality of life reduction and then also a life expectancy reduction over time. I mean, that's just a fact. And so what we try to do is, and, and Greg, the trick is, and I know you know this from business school, the trick is, 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 is not to, like, I know I have something that has utility. I know I have something that is valuable. Does the customer or the user know mm -hmm. that? And what do I need to tell them or show them um, in a very intelligent, thoughtful, empathetic way that gets them to use it and buy into it and see the value that I know exists, right? Other than having a doctor or a trainer tell them. Now I know the doctor trainer route, which is the B2B2C route, I, I'm very confident about that. What I really wanna do is build a community of early adopters or just people that see value. And these people are connected psychographically, not demographically. And what I mean by that is whether you're a type two diabetic, a pregnant mother to be, a weekend warrior or a professional athlete, there's something about health reel that you find intrinsically valuable. And you may not look anything like the other person who uses it, but for you, because there's something in it that you love, you will choose to use it. And that's a psychographic connection, not a demographic connection. You know what I mean? And that's really the goal. And I think I have a pretty good marketing idea and I have some really good incentivization ideas on how to scale this. I'll save all that for another uh, discussion if you want to hear about that. But ultimately, I think that the fact that we're able to aggregate um, mental health, emotional health, physical health, nutrition, incentivization, along with asynchronous exercise programs, this is all gonna be in one app as opposed to some like bifurcated, you know, multi-pronged thing where you need seven apps. The goal is to have this all in one. And I think that's our advantage along with our IP um, and the way that we built this, I think those are all our advantages. And when it comes to like Fitbit and Apple and all these other companies, I think they all see the value in having something like this. It's just that no one's really done it. The closest thing to it is Amazon's Halo. If you ever get a chance, you can look up Amazon Halo. They are doing some of the stuff that we're doing. But between you and I, and I guess whoever watches this, this podcast, we created and filed our patents around Health Reel way before Amazon Halo came out. So... That's to be determined on what, what that all means. You know, that's going to be handled later. I'm not worried about it because I do believe that one restaurant in a outdoor mall, one, re one restaurant in an outdoor mall is not an outdoor mall. You need a network effect of, of, of restaurants to bring people to, to a place. And I think that between Amazon Halo and, and Health Reel, and maybe that these new burgeoning companies, we can create some type of network effect, but I believe that we'll have the best product because I'm, I'm the one behind my product. I'm not Mark Zuckerberg who stumbled on someone else's idea and fucking co-opted it. But hey, good luck for him. Good, good job for him. He's, he's going to be a trillionaire. But at the end of the day, this concept is mine. Like I live it and I breathe it. I do it. Like I live it. You know, I'm not just somebody who tells you one thing and then I'm fucking eating a bunch of Doritos and, and shit on the side. Don't get me wrong. I like to have some Doritos once in a while, but it doesn't make up the bulk of my diet. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I live it. And if you look at my Instagram page, you'll see, I drink, I have fun, but I also have a six pack and I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying that like, I take the shit seriously, but I'm not going to do all this and not have a good time. Like my girlfriend and I just went wine tasting in the Hamptons, bro. And we drank a lot of wine and we drank a lot of tequila and we ate a lot of shit. But guess what? I planned that. I earned that. And my goal is to get people to, to adopt a lifestyle where they live healthy, but they earn their fun. That's really the goal. Absolutely, man. I, I, would, I would never bet against you. Uh, what, what's next? So you're, you're in open beta. Uh, you're, you're, you're testing. Uh, when, when, when do you hope to, to sort of get this thing out in the market and, and really get going on it? So, dude, I wish Andrew was on here, Klein, because he could probably fucking tell some horror stories or tell some real good stories about how he's probably helped some folks in his, in his world. But I've been trying to close out my series a dude for a while. 
and it's a big chunk of money on a really nice valuation on, on my company. And as soon as we get that closed, um, it's going to be jet fuel. We're going to build everything that we're going to build. I have all the stakeholders. I have all the engineers. I have all the marketing folks just lined up waiting. Um, and as long as they don't bail on me, which if they did, I, I could just replace them. I mean, I, I'm the architect. It's my design. You know what I mean? My team isn't going anywhere. Like my close like engineers and coders aren't going anywhere. But as long as we can close our Series A before the end of the year, my guess is by end of Q2 in 2022, early Q3 of 2022, uh, this will be rocking and rolling, dude. And we'll be out there marketing. Uh, we'll be out there selling and, and doing For it. For all potential investors out there, how much are you looking to raise and what valuation? Yeah, so the Series A was completely bought out by one company, $5 million. Um, and, you know, due diligence is done. We're just trying to get a closed date right now. COVID has definitely affected it. Um, the LPs are, are foreign LPs, but everything is clean. Um, they do have an office in Silicon Valley. I don't want to say more than that right now just because, you know, we're not done yet. Mm -hmm. Had we closed, I tell you the valuation, you know, the, the amount of, of, uh, the company they captured, you know, I tell you everything. Um, and, and later when we get done with this, I'll tell you everything anyway, but the amount that we're raising is five mil and everything is, you know, we, we're at the very, very, like if this was a, a, a 10 mile race, we're at, we're at mile 9.75. You know what I mean? Awesome, man. So. Well, look, brother, I really appreciate you, uh, you, you, you coming on and talking a little bit about this. I know we had some uh, technical difficulties along the way, so we'll, 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 we'll see what we'll have to, to redo down the road. But uh, uh, I really appreciate it, man.